In a year where six wins felt realistic, 2023 left us with more to be desired. You can blame the quarterback play, the way they managed the offense, or the injuries that took away the biggest playmakers. But even though Rule's first team struggled, they learned a lot in the process. Now they enter year two. The team understands the vision. The coaches know the strength on their roster. And after losing five games by one score, Matt Rule knows where to turn his attention to get these guys over the hump. So today, I'm going through the entire 2024 schedule to give you my way too early prediction for how things might go in Rule's second year, and I'll give you my thoughts on every team they get to play. But what's up guys, I'm Connor Hayden, and this is Corn Crazed. If you're a fan of Nebraska or the Big Ten, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss my breakdown on the transfers. And if you think Nebraska's offense is gonna fix their issues this spring, hit the like button and help us get to 1,000. But now, let's get into it. He's hit. Taking a shot downfield, wide open end zone, caught touchdown. Last year, the conversation around the schedule was all about how bad it was and that if there was ever a time to take advantage, 2023 was it. Outside of Michigan, Iowa was the only opponent to finish in the top 25, but worse, only half the teams they played won at least six games. And this year kind of feels the same. Up until the last week in October, the only bowl eligible team they face is Rutgers. UTEP and Indiana both have new head coaches. The toughest game on the schedule before Ohio State's either going to be Colorado in week two or on the road against Purdue. And if they do pull it off and go six and one or seven and oh, there's a chance they could finish three and two on the back end. And my point here isn't to call this schedule easy because I don't think it is. But just like last season with Michigan, there's only one guaranteed loss with Ohio State. And if the offense does fix their issues, we're talking about nine win potential here, which really just means you should get excited because we'll get another full season of competitive games without the blowouts that make you want to turn the TV off. I burned a lot of time these last few months working on content and doing live streams, and I think I spent like 75% of my time thinking about Nebraska football. So since there wasn't a bowl game, I took some time off. I went to Phoenix for the Fiesta Bowl and to hang out with my dad. And while I was out there, there were some portal additions, and then there's new conversations around Dana Holgerson joining the staff. And these are all important things to talk about, but subjects I'm going to save for a different video later this week. But anyway, while I was gone and needed some updates, I went over to the Character Chronicles YouTube channel where Adam broke down what was going on with the portal visitors and his thoughts on the coaching changes that'll come later this month. So if you hadn't had a chance to subscribe to his channel, make sure you click the description box below where I've got a link to the Character Chronicles website or just type in Adam Character into the YouTube search bar and you're gonna find a ton of content there to give you perspective from a former player. While I'm recording this video, I got some text saying that Nick Saban just retired. And honestly, I'm not too surprised by that. He's 72 years old. He has other business interests outside of college football and things to keep him occupied. He's already built a dynasty. And at this point, to get back to that level, he would have to rebuild something like he did before. I don't know that he has the interest to go back and start over, which kind of feels like he would need to. I think it's great for college football to see him come and go because when that guy goes, it gives another guy an opportunity to step in and build something great. I think Georgia is obviously the next in line to be the next dominant dynasty, but maybe in some dream world, Matt Rule can do it at Nebraska. And speaking of Matt Rule, he's known for making big jumps in year two. You know, at Temple, he went from two wins to six. And then at Baylor, he went from one to seven. If he has similar improvement at Nebraska, we're talking about a nine or 10 win season. But even if we are going conservative, seven and five or eight and four sounds pretty realistic. And you know, I'm not here to sell you Kool-Aid or to get you overexcited, but the facts are the facts. So let's go game by game to predict what the final record's gonna be. It starts off at home against UTEP on August 31st, and I can't tell you how good it feels knowing that a brand new QB, who also happens to be a true freshman with zero experience, gets to start the season in a calm environment against a Conference USA team who only won three games last year. And as boring as games like this can be, I'm actually happy this is how Nebraska opens their season. UTEP fired their head coach. They lost their top three players to Big 12 and SEC schools, and Unlike Northern Illinois or Louisiana Tech, who had some Power 5 talent on their rosters, UTEP's in total rebuild mode and might not score more than seven. 
Last year, they went to Northwestern and lost by 31. And a week later, they got rolled by Arizona in Tucson. So this will be a great opportunity to get multiple guys in without the fear of taking an L to start things off. Now, the second game gets a little tougher. Colorado was weak in Dion's first season, but they still won this game convincingly, and they really pissed Nebraska off with all the bullshit comments and the watch nonsense at midfield. Their defense should get better, but with Colorado, it's all about scoring. Shador is going to be one of the best QBs in the country, and he's got an even stronger receiving core to throw to after they added the top targets from Vanderbilt and FAU. The O-line's returning two starters, but they picked up the number one tackle in the class and they got five starters from other schools out of the portal. And there's still no word on who their OC is going to be, but since it's Dion's team, it's probably going to be somebody with a pretty decorated resume. On defense, they ranked in the bottom four nationally with Charles Kelly, but it wasn't really his fault. They had no depth. Now, there will be a new DC, but more importantly, they added four D linemen to help the pass rush and one of the best corners in the portal to start opposite of Travis Hunter. Now, the key to beating Colorado is simple. Don't let Shador tear up the secondary like he was able to last year. Don't turn it over as often as Jeff Sims did and win the line of scrimmage. Of course, I'm going to take Nebraska to win at home, but it's not going to be easy, and I think this spread's going to be less than seven. Northern Iowa is a great follow-up. There will be a lot of emotions during week two, no matter how it ends. And rather than jump straight into a battle, you'd rather get a chance to let guys have an off week against another no-name school with no chance to pull the upset. But here's the thing. UNI is an FCS program who plays North Dakota State and the two Iowa schools regularly. So they're not uncomfortable playing in big games. And there's no way they'll be able to put up meaningful points on Tony White's defense, but it'll be another good opportunity to get the backups in early and find out who's ready to step up now that Big Ten play is going to start. For the fourth week in a row, Nebraska's at home, but now they take a step up in competition, or at least this should be a step up in competition since Illinois usually plays pretty tough. They return Luke Altmyer at QB and Pat Bryant, who was their number three receiver, but the O-line's not returning much and their number one back left for Purdue. So the offense that was already average is probably gonna be worse. On defense, Bielema added what he could from the portal to replace their NFL losses, but they were near the bottom of the Big Ten in almost every metric, and losing Ryan Walters as their DC ended up being a bigger loss than anybody predicted. Now, I like Illinois to come in and play physical, but there's a serious talent difference here, and playing Nebraska four weeks in, once Riola's found his rhythm and gotten comfortable, isn't going to help, so I think this will be a win. Last year, Nebraska lost four fumbles and they still managed to score 31 and hold Purdue's offense to zero points all the way until the fourth quarter. Hudson Card returns after a decent year one, but his top four targets hit the portal and the guys coming in from other schools all are dropping down a tier since they didn't get enough reps where they were before. They took 14 transfers in total, but I'm just not a big believer in the idea that they can fix their issues with a bunch of new linemen out of the portal and expect to compete in the Big Ten with a head coach in his second year who's still trying to navigate being a CEO while he builds the defense. And I do think Walters can get him back to a bowl game in a few years, but he lost his two best players to Oklahoma and Texas A&M, which is a pretty clear sign that there's still a lot more work to do. Unless it's a night game, the home crowd won't be too intimidating, and without that extra juice, I just don't think Purdue has any hope, so I'm going to call this one a win too. Now we start October, and to get to this point undefeated actually isn't that impressive. If the defense just plays at the level they did last year, and if Riola cuts the turnovers in half, Nebraska will win every game in September by at least 10. But now, they've got to play Rutgers, who had a harder schedule last year and finished with 7 wins after they beat Miami in the bowl game. Their defense ranked 16th nationally, but the issue was their offense couldn't score since the QB couldn't move the ball. He was basically Heinrich Harburg, so that'll tell you everything you need to know. Shiano went to the portal and picked up Ethan Kaliak Manis from Minnesota, who wasn't great, but he still completed a lot more passes than Wims at. So the offense is going to be more efficient. And to help at receiver, they added the top FCS transfer, who went for 1,300 yards last year at Monmouth. And I'm not expecting Rutgers to win more than eight games, but this will be the first real test of the season since Kaliak Manis is already 2 0 against Nebraska. Because they have to lose at some point, I'll say he comes to Lincoln and hands him another loss before the bye week. 
Indiana's in a great spot to start the year. They get Charlotte, FIU, and Western Illinois all in September. And then if they can beat Maryland, Nebraska, and Purdue, they'll go bowling in their new head coach's first season. Signetti's 119-35 and as a head coach, and after winning 52 games at James Madison, he convinced 10 of his guys to follow him to Bloomington. And more importantly, he went out to Ohio and he grabbed Curtis Rourke, who threw for over 7,000 yards and 50 TDs in the last three seasons. It's hard to predict how much different IU is going to look with so much roster turnover and a new staff who's never coached in the Power Five. But the one thing I can tell you is that building a line in the Big Ten with former Sunbelt players and a backup from Wisconsin isn't going to pay off right away. And they might be fun to watch, but I don't see this being much of a game going into the fourth quarter. Now at this point, I'm predicting a 6-1 and one start. Nebraska's probably a top 25 team, but they still haven't played anybody who's going to finish with more than 7 wins. But this week that changes, because Ohio State's loaded up and they're the favorite to win the Big Ten. Who would have thought Will Howard would skip out on his commitment to Lincoln Riley and flip over to Ohio State? Now, what probably happened was he saw how bad Lincoln Kineholtz and Devin Brown looked against Missouri in the Cotton Bowl, and he knew it'd be an easier job to win than going head-to-head -head with Miller Moss at USC. But you know what's crazier than their QB addition? The fact that Travion Henderson decided to come back after he racked up over a thousand yards last year and Quinshawn Judkins came in from Ole Miss after he proved to be the best back in the SEC. Their offense is sick. Howard's a Big 12 champion quarterback who's thrown 48 touchdown passes. The receiver room's loaded with four five-star recruits in the last two classes and now their running back room features two of the best three backs in the country. The defense only gave up 11 points a game last year and probably matches that again with a better offense. So what should we expect? It's in Columbus. It'll likely be a top 25 matchup with Ryan Day trying to make a point. And even though Nebraska is going to be good, they're still a long way away from being a legitimate championship contender. I'd expect a decent game and a strong effort, but losing by 14 would probably be a win in this situation. After two weeks on the road, UCLA comes into Lincoln battle-tested. To start the year, they play LSU, Penn State, and Oregon, which means their record might be deceiving. Even with a three-quarterback strategy, Chip Kelly's offense ranked 32nd nationally, and Ethan Garbers, who returns as the starter, had a solid season completing 67% of his passes and only throwing three picks to 11 touchdowns and finishing with a huge comeback win over Boise in their bowl game. The problem is, even if Garbers can connect with the few good receivers they have, the O-line was 17th in sacks allowed last season and they couldn't protect the QBs. Most of the line is graduating, but there's still a big question mark around that group and playing a front seven that can create havoc like Nebraska did last year is going to cause a lot of problems for that offense. On the other side, their defense was outstanding, but the DC left for USC and he took their best safety with him, and the front seven only returns three of their starters. I'm sure the D's going to be good again, but top 10's probably not realistic, and that's the level they'd need to be at to win in Lincoln since the offense is going to get harassed by the black shirts. So I'm going to call this a win. After another bye week, Nebraska's back on the road, and this time it's in LA for the first West Coast game in the new Big Ten. And I remember being 12 years old going to the Coliseum with my whole family to watch Zach Taylor and Bill Callahan play a top five USC. And I've waited 18 years for the chance to watch Nebraska play in that stadium again. The best part is I can Uber down there and it only takes me like 20 minutes. So if I did want to come back to my setup so I could live stream right after, it'd be pretty easy to do that. But let's talk about the matchup. You've got Lincoln Riley, who beat Nebraska in 2021 and holds a 4-0 record over Matt Rule since he was never able to beat OU when he was at Baylor. But things are different now. SC's in total rebuild mode on defense after they lost some of their best guys to the portal and brought in a new DC. The offense that's been so dominant with Caleb Williams has to find out how consistent Miller Moss can be with a group of young receivers and some new starters on the O-line. But the reality is, Lincoln Riley's one of the best offensive minds in the game, and he'll find ways to score even when he does play a top 25 defense. What made USC look so bad last year was Alex Grinch, and I think the lack of physicality in practice really held that team back. De'Anton Lynn worked in the NFL before he was at UCLA, and he can get back to the basics before he installs an entirely new scheme that fits with an offense that scores so fast. 
SC brought in five power five starters from the portal to help rebuild on that side of the ball. And if you watched UCLA play this last year, you saw how tough it was to score on them. If I could guarantee one win on this entire schedule, this would be my pick. But the reality is, Lincoln Riley's in year three with some of the best skill players in the country, and being at home against a coach who's never beaten him sounds like a recipe for disaster. So I'm gonna say USC pulls this one out and Nebraska's handed another loss. After a painful finish in LA, they're back at home for senior day against Wisconsin. Luke Fickle's first year had its ups and downs, but after fielding the top 40 D in year one, they went and added two big time linebackers from USC and Arkansas, a two time All American FCS edge rusher, and one of Syracuse's best defenders as a pass rusher. Tyler Van Dyke takes over for Tanner Mordecai at QB, and he gets three of their top four receivers from last year to work with, but the transition from power run to a spread wasn't all that great. They finished with the 69th ranked offense, and they only scored 23 points a game, and if Nebraska's offense had a pulse in the second or the third quarter of last year's game, they would have won that by seven. Since I think SC is going to win the week before, I think Nebraska is going to bounce back strong off the loss, and I'm going to take them to win in a revenge spot here. And last, we'll get to see a road trip to Iowa City against the most overrated top 25 team in America. Cade McNamara comes back for his final season after last year was cut short, and Luke Lachey returns as the starting tight end and probably his number one target. There's no word on who will take over at OC, but it won't matter since Kirk's still in charge and he refuses to make a change in philosophy since he wants to keep sending his punters to the NFL. The defense that finished ranked 7th nationally returns multiple all Big Ten guys and their all-American outside linebacker, so even if they can't score again, the offense just needs to protect the ball and they can beat any average team they face. Iowa set up for another 10-win finish with the only two top 25 teams on the schedule being Washington and Ohio State. So if they do end up 9-2 and or 8-3 and going into that last game with a chance to get to the Outback Bowl, I'll say they come out fired up and they take down Nebraska at home for the second year in a row. And that leaves them at eight and four, which is where I thought they'd end up last year before I found out we were lied to about Jeff Sims and thinking that he had a chance to at the very least be serviceable in the Big Ten. But in year two, where a true freshman starts at QB, you have to face three top 25 teams and this staff still trying to build towards something bigger. I think eight wins would be more than enough to keep the Nebraska fan base happy. But this isn't the ceiling, and it's definitely not the floor, because if Dylan Riola ends up being what a lot of us believe he can be, there's no way I can guess how many games this team can win, given all the talent they return and all the new faces they brought in. But I want to know what you think, so let me know in the comments below. Do you see eight wins on this schedule, or are you still traumatized from last year's disaster at QB? Can Matt Rule be the top 25 team in year two, or is he still a year away? And who do you think the most dangerous team is on this schedule, not named Ohio State? Iowa's always a problem. USC's tricky with their head coach. I don't know. I'm interested to see how they all look early on. But that's all I've got for today. So until next time, thank you for being here. And I will see you in the next one. Go Big Red.